Hello. Hello. And the Blue Shirt Boys are back. We are indeed. <laughs> Look at these blue shirts. <laughs> I'm pretty sure now, we're if wearing you, if, blue if shirts. If you don't guess what we're talking about, go back to part two and watch that. And you'll be and watching. go to the section on Grand Valines. Yeah, exactly. Um, so today okay, so we we're doing part for... three. I can't part believe we've three. managed to make this book last three parts and probably the best part of five hours if we take an hour doing yeah. this one, I think. Wait, yeah. Like that. No, four hours or something like that. But it's my God. Not, so. Yeah, part three of Age of Propaganda. Um, and I think, uh, where did we get up to? It was... So we just finished the Grand Falloon and the defending against the Grand Falloon, I believe. Mm -hmm. So we're now up to guilt and persuasion. Lovely stuff. Should we just jump straight into it, I guess? Yeah, let's... <laughs> oh, so it'll be another two hours. So let's... <laughs> yeah, so we're going to we're gonna cover all the rest and then do it again. No, okay. Okay, so the power of guilt... Uh, to convict and to persuade stems, as with most emotional appeals, from its power to direct our thoughts and channel to our energies. When we feel guilty, we typically pay little attention to the cogency of an argument, to the merits of a suggested course of action. Instead, our thoughts and actions are directed to removing the feeling of guilt, to somehow make things right or do things the right way. We fall into this rationalization trap. Um, we were saying just before this that, you know, it, it's it's kind of similar to this idea that when somebody wants to persuade you they kind of try and make you imagine a better future but with the sort of guilt appeal they imagine you they make you imagine yourself doing something bad or ha or remind you of something you've done bad to make you feel guilty and feel like you have mm -hmm. to make amends slash change um yeah and these are particularly i guess effective techniques because feeling guilty is i guess particularly uncomfortable and therefore, you're willing to do many things to sort of get yourself out of that feeling. And if somebody, you know, accompanies a sort of guilt trip, I mean, that's the reason why they call it guilt trip, um, with a suggested course of action, like, you know, yeah. uh, pay me money or, you know, take me out for dinner because you've done this. Uh, people are more likely to do it because they just want to remove that sense of uh, that, that uncomfortable feeling. Yeah, no, precisely. Like, at at an individual level, we hate being in these kind of states, whether it's stress, whether it's guilt, whether it's embarrassment, all these kinds of things. And so that is our priority because our brain is either going, okay, if we're stressed, we're, then there may be some like survival issue going on. If we're guilty, then there may be like social pressure and we're going to get kicked out of our tribe or something. So, you know, these are feelings that take priority and the things that are pushed down are like the clarity of the argument whether it actually makes sense. Like, why is this person telling me all of this stuff? Mm. And so if I can elicit um, a guilt state in you, then you're not really going to listen to the flaws in my argument. And you're going to be like, but then I can be like, but here's the solution. You're like, oh, okay, okay, yeah, no, I want to mm. get rid of this um, feeling. And so it makes sense that, like, you know, it, it's kind of preyed upon um, yeah. to, to create this kind of guilt trap and then this like rationalization trap because afterwards once you've complied you'll be you'll be like oh no he gave me the solution it was great you know well yeah well i had to do that because you know I, I did this in the past you know um here they're saying like, guilt can be induced by reminding the target of past si past sins that have long be atoned for it's quite a good a good point like you know yeah. this could have been years ago but they remind you of it you know in years in the future they still go on about it to try and you know elicit a certain behavior um I think there was an interesting point here as well I've got, which is um, you can make it appear that the target is responsible for a crime that they did or did not commit. I, I don't know whether this was from this book, but they talk, isn't there that talk about how, you know, when um, a crime has been committed and you're like a murder suspect, people can technically make you feel so guilty that you end up like um, false confession, false confession. <clears throat> right? Like it is, I feel like it is a part of this sort of um, mechanism for people yeah. sort of, make you feel like you're guilty and eventually you confuse the guilt feelings of actually doing the action so you yeah, feel yeah, guilty because yeah. people are making you feel like you have done something yeah. you then start creating memories in your head where you actually have done the thing because you're trying to understand why you feel guilty well yeah i watched this i watched this crazy tv show on netflix and it was about false confessions okay. and just how some of the like police were like you know in certain circumstances 
have like walked people through so right like they haven't done the crime but they're sitting there and they're like but could you have done this you know and this person is feeling like you know uh, stress and everything already they're in this like state that they want to reduce and they'll be like look it's fine but do you think that you could have picked up the murder weapon and killed and they're just they what's also sort of expand right? of course, of course like, it's not it's not yeah, hard to pick exactly. up a knife and i mean i guess it's quite hard to actually kill somebody but it's you know it's not hard to do some of the actions they're describing right and the problem is visualizing it yeah no, you're right you're visualizing it and then you're probably trying to like put together the visualization yeah and the like the guilt feeling and then all of a sudden you might be like maybe maybe they're onto something maybe i like wasn't fully conscious when this happened maybe it was me maybe i you yeah. know why else am i feeling guilty unless it's some like deep level of like you know N- deep level of like truth that i know that i did commit this yeah yeah um, and normally spans for like hours at a time so yeah you know you've got fatigue stress guilt all these different things that are you know the person wants to reduce and then these people being like but could you do that and if you did then it's fine you know but at least we know what's going on so you see it as a kind of solution to reduce that kind of way yeah i think state. I do, I do think too bad we've taken it definitely to the extreme. The, the, you know, this we're talking about here, like, you know, making yeah, people yeah. believe they've committed a serious crime. Uh, but the majority of these guilt appeals can, I guess, can be just, you know, reminding somebody of the time maybe where they made a commitment and they didn't turn yeah. up to it. Um, you know, I can imagine that happens a lot with friendship groups. I can imagine somebody being like, oh, I remember that time you said you were going to be there and you weren't as a way to like, make them feel guilty to make them want to be maybe at a future event to be yeah. like oh i remember last time you did said you were going to come then you didn't so like yeah you've got to come this time that's a level of sort of like a trying to induce a feeling of guilt through, and i could imagine that they yeah. they prey on like f- friends or like um uh like being like oh your mate said that you would do this yeah you know um yeah, okay, and yeah. like bringing that extra layer that like really hammers at home because it's like okay there's one thing being guilty like you didn't show up for this commitment but be like oh your mate said that you would show up for this commitment or something like that you know is that is there a level as well of this like with the with the covid stuff as well of like a future guilt so like being like you're responsible for this if you don't act in this way because that's kind of the same guilt mechanism it's kind of it, fear with guilt a lot, a lot of it is it's like it's it's either herd immunity or you're killing people yeah that's how they that's how they'll phrase it because it's like technically you're 22 you know you're young you're young like obviously not you're 22 you're 26 but yeah my point being yeah i I didn't want you to get confused that i was just talking about some like you know um, (laughs) situation yeah no but as in like a young person had like a 0.001 percent chance of like dying from this thing so they didn't have to get the vaccine but if you did then you'd be saving all these other people that's the whole herd immunity kind of like clause um and so if you didn't then it's guilty because like you could go out and you could give it to someone who could have a higher chance of it if they yeah uh, um that's the whole like argument but there is an element of guilt in that it's like guilt tripping people into doing it because they're saying this is the only way that we can get from point a to b and you have to get vaccinated in the in the process um well guilt yeah i guess guilt was one of those powerful ways to motivate anybody because once again people don't like to you know be in states of uncomfort for too long right um and people don't like to feel like they've you know they're being judged negatively i guess is another way of putting it because i guess a guilt a, a guilty feeling is kind of like the the awareness that you're being judged in a negative way i guess you know when yeah. you feel guilty is you kind of realize that socially you're going to be ridiculed for something you've you've done or something yeah. you might do um and that's kind of where this feeling comes where you have to sort of make amends for your sins whether it's apologies whether it's you know do the thing this person's suggesting whether it's mm. you know d- donate money whatever um and I think picking on what you just said, actually, that was a good point, is what you might do. So yeah. it may not be something in your past, but if you don't do this now, then it's something that you could be ridiculed later on in life. Yeah. And so it, like, controls your behavior based on, you know, the prospect. Yeah. Of, uh, yeah, I'll, yeah. Um, I've already got, like, the idea of, like, you know, some sort of sleazy salesman being like, you know, if you don't take this opportunity, imagine, like, your family life, you know, knowing that you could have had this but your family, so, you know, your wife's just divorced you. Imagine the feeling yeah. you're going to feel like making you try and feel future guilty for like the fact you couldn't make the, you know, the step today yeah. to buy the course. But it, and, and, and then it's the self sell, but with guilt, yeah. isn't it? But with guilt. It's yes. Yeah. yeah. Right? You like imagine those guilty it. feelings or yeah. You imagine the future guilt that you would feel based upon the fact that you don't act in a specific way now. 
Yeah. I mean, yeah, a lot of appeals are like that to a degree. Yeah. Um, like, we, like we were saying earlier, the whole, like an imagine a really nice future, you can then turn it into guilt by then being like, you know, if you don't do this, you're not going to, you're not going to get this imagined future. It's going to be much worse. And then you start feeling guilty because you're like, oh, but you know, I've got the chance right now. And you know, if I, you know, if I miss this opportunity, then I'm going to feel guilty for like not taking it and having this imagined future that I want. Um, so yeah. it kind of links in my head between the two. Absolutely. Because you get this future sense of guilt for like not seizing, seizing the day. Carpe diem. Carpe diem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. No, precisely. But yeah, I think, I think that's it for guilt. Um, yeah. Um, and so the next section is how to diagnose persuasive communication. So yeah. there are some questions that can be asked to help diagnose persuasive communication. Um, so the first one is what does the source of information have to gain? So yeah. what is the incentive of the person trying to sell me this thing? Sell me this idea, this product, so, whatever it is. But it's like, clarify, why this is, yeah, if you walk into a car, car sale, like shop, it's, they're trying to sell you a car right so yeah. <laughs> the incentives immediately you know are they're trying to get you to buy this car so you've got to be on the lookout like that's yeah. that's what they have to gain and it's yeah. the same with most things the moment you get contacted by any company relatively there's going to be some level of um they're trying to convince you to do something related yeah. to what they do um and thing is i guess there's like a difference between you actively going out of your way to look at something like you wouldn't just randomly walk into a car salesman uh, you know a, a car shop but so mm. you've actively done that but when someone comes to you and it sounds like they're pitching an idea you kind yeah. of have to ask like well why is this person pitching me this idea or yes this product yeah. or whatever you know why are like, they you know, showing me this car in, in instead of this car right like exactly. There's, exactly there's something to be gained i guess yeah yeah well there could be something to be gained yeah um, um Okay. And then the second one is why are these choices being presented to me in this manner? So, well, like we've talked about so many different techniques now, haven't we about how people can try and like persuade you or influence you. Um, and like, I remember particularly in like influence, it was like, you know, you kind of need to, if you start to really like the person, if they're like trying to be really likable, then clock on, like, why do I suddenly like this person so much? You know, it's like, it's unjustified in a sense, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you kind of have to be in tune with your, like, I would say your emotions, but also like how they're phrasing things. If you've mm -hmm. already clocked on that someone's trying to sell you something, then the next thing to clock onto is the methods with which they're using to get something across yeah. or to make something appeal to you, you know? Um, uh, interestingly yeah. here as well, because he's talking about the choices being presented. So I guess a couple of other techniques could be being used here. So a way choices can be presented is, you know, like the, um, the anchor effect where, you know, let's just say you're buying a house, they present to you a choice, which is obviously not the choice they want you to take. So for example, like a really beaten down house, which looks like it needs massive renovation. Yeah. And then they show you a really beautiful looking house for a very similar asking price. And then you kind of know it's been the other one's been presented as the decoy. The, I think it's called the decoy effect. And they do that as well yeah. with, um, <clears throat> I think it was like the economist or something where they have, you know, the packages of subscriptions. And one of them is like uh, digital only one of them is digital and physical. No, sorry. One's physical only one's digital and one's digital and physical. And like they make it so the digital and physical together is like two pound more than yeah. the, the physical or the digital, whatever. And it yeah. just basically makes it a no brainer. So this yeah. is one of the ways people can like, you know, frame choices. Another one could, could be like by learning, you know, let's just say you're a family man and being like, this is the family man's car. So they've presented to you a choice yeah. based upon what they know about you. Um, and that's another, well, I was going to say slide. There's another sales. Grand Falloon, mate, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah. Well, no, it is a grand, it is a Grand Falloon. Yeah, it is. Because they're um, saying, like, you belong in this kind of bracket and this is how these people yeah. are. Oh, you know, this I think, is how yeah. they behave or live. Yeah. But also yeah. the classic, like, the family, like, if you think about how big that box is, the family man box, like, most people have families. So yeah. it's, like, literally everybody. So it's not really a specific, you know, type of person who fits in this. There's a, yeah. a large variety of people within that category. Um, yeah. But, yeah, that's, that's how people, you know, why they present it in different ways. And then are there other options and other ways of presenting these options? So similar to what we just said, there are other ways, I guess it's, you know, giving you more than the current options they're giving. So I guess mm. a classic question could be like, is there anything else you can offer? Like, is this, is this the only two choices I get? So if, you know, if you go into a car, a car shop and they, you know, present only two choices to you, 
and then there's like five other cars over there you'd be like what about that yeah. one um because yeah. realistically if there is something to be gained quite a lot of the time it could be for example with a salesman they get a sales commission based upon what they sell and they might be you know incentivized to sell the newer cars when in reality there's a you know a used one over there which is half the price they didn't yeah. make as much money from it but they haven't presented that to you even as a choice because obviously for them you know it doesn't not that it doesn't look good they're not being incentivized to try and sell those yeah. second hand there's not as much money in it um no, exactly and it is it, it you know them only giving you certain options is a frame isn't it? It's like we talked about this, I think in the first part of this book in terms of like framing a whole situation, if you go in, they'd be like, Oh, it's either between this or this. It's like, well, actually no, like you said, there's all of this as well. Um, and why are you framing it just on those two? Yeah. Uh, we've kind of, we kind of just reduce this to cells, but you're right. There is a level of like political decisions as well. So like, you know, you, giving you two options, you're like, you, you're either against guns or you're with guns, like yeah. that type of thing. You're like either is either all or nothing, whether there yeah. is like a, you know, there is potential other solutions in the middle ground, which nobody's talking about. Like, yeah, and it, it, it's, it's allowed it, right? So you find that a lot, and we talked about it. I think in um, the social warming book, actually, about scissor statements and how there's or it, it everything comes down to a yes or no, especially in politics. Mm-hmm. It's like with Brexit, it's either you're for or against, and if you do that, you're either racist or you're not, right? And it's like the same thing goes. Like someone might ask for more. Um, uh same thing with guns it's like it's either illegal or it's not or there should be stricter measures to see whether you're allowed a gun right that's the complexity there but that's ignored and it's either yes or no for Mm. or against and that's the thing is like you know however it's framed those are the options that are being presented to you but normally there's actually way more complexity in it and so you just need to be aware that there are normally other options and why aren't they using them or why aren't they talking about them i guess yeah like yeah other options other solutions, you know, which is just never presented, right? And it's quite interesting when, when we get around to the tyranny of metrics, but he makes a really good point around transparency. And he says something along the lines of the reason why governmental officials come across as so hypocritical is because they often have to do the nitty gritty solution finding behind closed doors. But to, 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 to the public, they have to be like, I'm against or I'm for, because that's what the public want. Yeah. So they always come across as really hypocritical because they have to have a stance. And then when they get behind the closed doors of like having an actual meeting with people who are actually trying to solve these problems, they have a way more nuanced conversation. And then yeah. when they then end up creating a policy, people then go, but you said you were for, you said you were against the story and you've created something along the middle ground. But it's, it's literally because of that reason that they yeah. have to be this way. Yeah. Um, and I thought it was really interesting. Uh, it's kind of a side note, but. No, um, it's, it is very interesting. And I wonder if that says something about why we're so polarized politically. There's only left or right and there's no one really in the middle, you know, because yeah. like all the decisions that are made either are for or against. Um they're very binary. Well, well, a lot of things aren't even that easy to like, for part of reading the scene like a state as well as, you know, people think, oh, somebody creates a policy and it just works. Yeah. But you forget that the people who they apply the policy to are like, you know, sentient beings who can reject these proposals. So like, for example, yeah. let's just say in America, somebody all of a sudden was like, right, we're getting rid of gun ownership. Good luck taking the guns off the people who have the guns. You yeah, need yeah. the army to do that. And they're yeah, probably yeah. Have to, like there's going to be bloodshed, which is one of the reasons why I believe that is com- is completely out of the question to take the guns away because you can't. Well, How did can you, you see what they did? Uh-huh. You see what they did in Australia? Yeah, so, be- and I'm not sure whether they would have anywhere near as many guns as like Americans do. But basically, there was like this um, uh, high school shooting, I think it was, or something like that. Okay. In I can't remember when it was. I want to say it was like 20 years ago. And so then they were like, yeah, we probably shouldn't have any more guns anymore. And everyone was like, uh, yeah, okay, fine. And so they just collected all these guns. And they were like, you know, when you go to like a heap, like a, you know, um, a skip place, there were just mountains of guns. Really? They were so all just like, once again, like, but, this is the thing. Yeah. There is like, there is a chance that you're going to get a, like a, a large amount of people who will, you know, see light and then want to hand it in. Yeah. And then you'll also get people maybe who, you know, if you make it like a, a public effort, a bit like with the COVID stuff, if you create like a prop, like a propaganda campaign around about like national security and like, you know, the values you stand for by handing a gun, you probably convince a few more, but the problem with it is you're never going to convince everybody. And that's where the violence will happen. And then you'll probably end up with more harm than you would have done if you can find like a middle yeah. ground solution, um, yeah. which is part of the reason why it's, it's a lot easier to try and do other solutions than just, you know, a blanket not allowed anymore. 
Yeah, um, yeah. There's loads of things they could do. You know, you could even offer massive bounties. Like, you know, if you give if you give it, um, if you give your gun back, we'll give you like a hundred grand. I, th- I think, yeah. well, yeah. 100 grand per no, no, gun. Obviously, no, of course, <laughs> yeah. of course. But like, yeah, for example, no, with the you. people who okay. really, really, really don't want to do it, right? But you could, like, there's plenty of other things you could do, right? Yeah. And it would have to be done on, like, um, uh, uh, state level rather than, like, a federal level. <clears throat> because some states... Anyway, we're way off topic. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's basically the idea. Is that if they're only presenting you certain options, think outside the box and be like, well, why aren't they giving me these? Or why are these the only two that they're highlighting? Yeah. Um, and then the last part of this was... What, yeah. What would happen if I chose something other than the recommended option? What are the arguments for the other side? Um so it's kind of what we were just t- uh, touching yeah, yeah, on. I, anyway. That is what we were just touching yeah. on, like, you know, going um, outside of the scope of the discussion, you know. Yeah. If somebody presents you two options, there's probably a third or a fourth. It's just, you know, these are hidden. Um, and what are the consequences to you in that sense? Because, like, if someone's trying to sell you something, then you shouldn't feel like, well, you're being guilted, you know, yeah, that you're trying to go for a different alternative or a different option. Um, you know, what's wrong with going there? You've got nothing to lose in that sense yeah um yeah so should we move on to the next bit yeah let's go so propaganda versus education um so the american heritage dictionary of the english language defines propaganda as the systematic propagation of a given but let's say bus <laughs> actually does. doctrine um I I don't, I, yeah, that's, I don't a, know. that's a that's a read wise error that i think yeah I'll say a given doctrine. doctrine, Yes. Um, And education (laughs) as the act of imparting knowledge or skill. So I thought it was really interesting in this book that it kind of drew like drew parallels because technically if, if propaganda is like selectivity of what it's going to show to the masses or influence the masses with, then education is very similar because it's choosing what to prioritize to teach children. Mm -hmm. Right. And so technically, if we're using that specific definition, then it does fall into the same category. There's a very um, blurry line between the two, right? Because I think a lot of people would try and argue that the propaganda is more like a purposeful um, hmm. attempt at persuading somebody for like a commercial reason, I think. But then obviously there isn't because there's also political reasons to to try and, yeah, I'm, I'm already defeating my own argument here. But they've got this point here, which is like, again, we would all agree that a breakfast cereal and aspirin, aspirin ads are propaganda designed to promote the sale of certain brands. But then they raise a really good point here, which is, but what about American television programs, which still tend to depict women and minorities in stereotype roles? Or more subtly, or more subtly what about the vast majority of high school textbooks, textbooks sorry, in American history that virtually ignore the contributions of blacks and other minorities? Is this merely imparting knowledge? And what I find quite interesting as well is, if you think about what we were talking about I want to say it was influence, but it could have been age of propaganda. But when you don't have mental models of the world, for example, you've never experienced, I don't know, um, we were saying, in fact, some people have never met black people, right? And they've never experienced it. You only get your information through um, your media and TV yeah, and whatever. So you get a distorted model of reality because you are technically learning from that, regardless of what you think. If you think media doesn't imprint on you then you obviously you're, you're not self that self-aware are yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the point being here is if things are depicted in films and movies um depict certain stereotypes pe- that's technically educating people on those stereotypes yeah because and we were talking of counter like counter evidence in your personal life it's very hard to um to go against it right and we i think we're talking about criminology as well when we like how like mm-hmm. in movies police always solves crimes yeah. and then the reality is it's way harder than that but the problem is you end up with this false distortion of reality and that technically is education yeah. because where else do you get those beliefs apart from in the films and stuff you yeah. have been educated you have learned that the models are like the films and and so it's interesting it's interesting because we've talked about it in the sense that you may actively know that what you're watching is a TV show. You may actively know that it's fiction, that it's made up, or that, you know, social media isn't great for you and it shows you a distorted amount of whatever you're interested in, right? You may consciously be aware of that, but if you don't have an anchor or any other counter argument, then that still acts as your anchor, right? So even if you're like, oh, okay, yeah, no, I know I'm consciously aware right now, later on, 
when you have a, um, uh, when you come across some kind of interaction and you have an opinion about something, that opinion is based on that thing, on that anchor. Okay, whether you were consciously aware or be like, oh, well, I was watching TV at the time. Exactly. Realistically, it's a feeling. network, right? Like when somebody asks yeah. you a question about something you've never heard of before, apart from seeing it in a film, the yeah. only thing that activates when you hear that word is yeah. the film. And therefore, your decision will be informed or your, your what you're about yeah. to say afterwards will be informed by what you witnessed on that film. Yeah. Because think about it. The feeling you got about what happened, yeah. etc. Yeah. If you've never met a certain type of person and then they're portrayed on TV and you've never mm. met one and this is the first time you've ever seen them behave, well, of course, you'd be like, oh, well, that's how yeah. they behave then. But it's, you know? yeah. It's, it's the it, same with how the media portrays certain people, right? Like, you know, course. the left and the right, they portray each other's main sort of, you know, politicians or whatever as villains. Yeah. Therefore, yeah. your model, that person is a villain regardless yeah. of the fact that you've never met this person all you've seen is like a distorted uh lens that's like character like characterize them as something which they're like more than they're, they yeah. are maybe these things but they're also more than these things yeah um and it, yeah that's why i'm very like pro people taking a year or two out after school because if you think about it right like you're at school for 13 years okay and yes you're like living at uh, you may be living at home and you have other interactions outside of school but realistically it builds your mental model of how the world works right like you how the world work like the world's reality but then the thing is you're not really testing that okay so then when you take two years out you realize oh, wow, there's a massive discrepancy between what I learned at school yeah. and what reality is actually. I was like. even going to say, like, the uh, the fact that, for example, in history, you only learn very subset of, like, Western history at school, realistically. Yeah. Yeah. And then you realize, wow, the world's much bigger than just the history I learned. There's, yeah. And there's way other, there's uh, many more cultures with many different rules yeah. that, you know, we're not accustomed to. Well, I mean, that's the value of traveling, isn't it? It's the eye-opening experience that oh, your models absolutely. are just limited. And um, also, like, whether it's the content that you'll learn uh, that you're taught, whether it's like how you're taught or what subjects are like um, uh, the options at your school, all of those things basically create how you perceive the world. Like we're taught blanket subjects such as physics, chemistry and biology and all those kinds of things. But I found it really interesting when I went traveling after school, the amount of jobs that I just never heard of. You know, like so, like engineering, you don't come across unless you're really in maths, right? Obviously, mm -hmm. I'd heard of engineering, but there were all these like subsets, and that's the thing is like there's so much more complexity. But at school, it has to be simplified because we're all fucking dumb at school and we're all, you know young. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the thing is like you know you're you're given a template of how the world works, and it's not until you go out and you realize, okay, I've got to actually fill in all these gaps because this is where you know there's either discrepancy, this is wrong, it's outdated. Like think about mm -hmm. all the stuff that is outdated at school you know yeah. like all the information yeah yeah no, and they have to like because obviously things change and perceptions change all yeah. the time therefore like you know science changes let's just say like new findings like basically yeah. let basically think uh sorry new findings make paradigms that were like basically decided as true wrong so therefore yeah. everything you've ever learned is technically wrong uh, that's why I've always thought this idea of being like, you've got to be really humble because, you know, one thing can basically disprove everything, right? Like yeah. something can come out of the, you know, the blue and basically disprove the whole entire model yeah. that you've been currently using. And therefore everything you spent your life work, you know, learning, it's not like, it's not necessarily a hundred percent wrong, but it's not a hundred percent correct. No. Um, and yeah, so it, it is, yeah. Uh, you could argue that under that definition of what propaganda is in terms of like selecting what to uh, selecting a certain doctrine, education could fall under that. It's not, yeah. It, yeah. it shouldn't be like applied with like a kind of negative lens because at the end of the day, they do have to select something. Right. But, um, uh, but yeah, there is an element of propaganda in education. I guess you could argue. Uh, there's a point here that says, as Philip Zimbardo and his colleagues have pointed out. So Philip Zimbardo was the guy who basically ran that Stamford prison um, experiment. Yeah. Um, and he stated that these examples do more than simply reflect the capitalistic system in which the education is occurring. They systematically endorse the system, legitimize it, and by implication suggest it is the natural and normal way. So the thing that he's getting to uh, getting at is that, you know, based on, based on your like cultural upbringing, okay 
or like the culture that is portrayed in your education that is co constantly reinforced mm -hmm. and there's a thing here that's called in like psychology that we use i think it's also used in other sciences it's called like weird so it stands for yeah. white educated industrialized rich democratic so if you only do research on those kinds of people well then it's skewing the rest of the, you know it's skewing the results because you're not taking into consideration all the other different types of people, all the different cultures that don't fit into that um, acronym. Um, yeah. Is that, so, sorry, mate, I've just, I was lost in thoughts then. That's right. Um, th wasn't Zimbardo the smoking barrel guy as well? The smoking gun? Have you, do you remember that analogy? Oh, I don't know that one actually. Cause, cause he was the, he was the guy who set up the, people behaving badly in prison right the whole yeah I mean, this is what you're saying, right and yeah. he, he came up with a conclusion that there's like a difference between oh well, it's not a smoking barrel he talked about this idea of like a barrel being the way if you, somebody becomes evil it's not like their character sometimes it's the the barrel of the gun which directs you to be yeah, yeah. Uh, that's behaved. interesting um there was like uh, yeah. let me just quickly look it up a barrel that they shape the analogy. bullet and they yeah that's it into in a direction and then let you go Oh, that's it. Bad apples or bad barrels, the Lucifer effect. Um, and he, he argues that, you know, you, you're not necessarily like a bad apple, so to speak. Sometimes you are in a bad barrel, which puts you in a trajectory, which yeah. makes you behave in a bad way. Um, looking at this as well, this is, this was quite an interesting point though, about the, the mathematics and how in education it can imply cultural norms through mm. examples we use. Um, so yeah. you got here. So sort of most most examples in a mathematical textbook um, deal with buying, selling, renting, working for wages. Um, and they, did you did you talk about this about a quote? Sorry, no. Yeah, yeah. Not, I said yeah. It, yeah. Sorry, I mean I I completely zoned out for like two sorry, minutes. Was deep in deep in my own thoughts. Sorry, um, but it's just interesting, isn't it? Because like I guess the same happens across all the different types of 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 um subjects we learn at school i'm trying mm. to think obviously maths is the most easiest example to see how sort of like capitalism itself comes into it in terms of you know it normalizes the spending of money and exchange of goods etc yeah i'm yeah. just trying to think is there any other examples in education where this kind of exists where it normalizes the current culture or the current um I guess uh, I guess in this day and age, you would argue biology would normalise the idea of two genders. <laughs> well, so, yeah, um, yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, I guess anywhere that like, well, if you take that acronym in weird, mm -hmm. any discrepancy against that in in education. Okay, so okay, if the, it, like, yeah. if the diversity is not like actually accurate, right? Yeah. Um, if the um, uh western what was it, it? educated industrial educated rich, yeah so yeah, uh, yeah democratic um i'm just I'm, I'm just trying to think of other examples from when you know other subjects where stuff sort of i guess i i get history to a degree history would probably be it like it, it, the inclusivity of certain things and not of others mm -hmm. um i tell you what's also interesting is like i found this as you had like maths exams over the years the mm. names with which were included in the examples changed. So yes. yeah, it would yeah. be like Tom and John. Well, and then more racially like, diverse, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which was interesting. That's, like, you know, That is interesting. Um, but that's also interesting how a political agenda can come through education. But that it. means they obviously are very aware of the power of education to create, you know, these... Using these it as norms. a propaganda tool. Yeah, yeah. 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 They, they, there's that thing in America where they're saying now there's a lot of uh books sort of you know going with the sort of transgender sort of like yeah. no sorry the um the fact the genders are non-bot like is there's not such a thing as a binary gender sort of yeah thing which is quite interesting as well because once again once you become familiar with these ideas when you're young you're more likely to not just believe but they're you know they they are part of your world world view right yeah um just like when you select the stuff you learn in history, for example, we, I don't, I know, for example, if you did a level, I think you might've learned about like the Chinese history, but I don't remember studying any sort of Chinese history. Yeah. No, I don't when I was, I ever touched it. Cool. Um, yeah, I was mainly sort of the Western Europe. Yeah. It was um, world war one, world war two, England yeah. basically being a hero. Um, <laughs> that's interesting as well. But literally, yeah. Propaganda. 
but it is it is interesting because it can be used as a political tool. It's just the thing is it's a long term political tool, right? And I remember watching um a video on it was like a KGB boss, and it was talking about how to change like the culture of a society, and he, he was basically saying, yeah, you implement it over a long time um, in education, you basically change how people perceive reality, um, you know, because most people's foundations are built on their education. Yeah, um, yeah. Of course, it's like, once again, what we're saying when you, you know, you don't have a model of how things work, you, yeah. your models are created through the education, right? Like, yeah. you know, and especially with the history stuff, like whatever you learn in history, you technically take it as gospel as that's what's happened in the past. Yeah. But you realize there's multiple different histories, multiple different countries. And once again, we'll get onto it in a minute, but with the selection edge, like when you select things to learn, you're technically selecting against other, other choices, which could yeah. also, you know, inform other models. Right. Yeah. Um, no, absolutely. So should we, should we use that as a segue onto the next point then? Yeah. Do, do you want to go straight to selection as propaganda or do you want to do the propaganda and value misalignment first? Well, I was going to say, oh, actually, yeah, let's do the selection. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah, I think because it's kind of we're talking about, obviously, yeah. you know, what you like you mentioned earlier, like selecting what to learn is is essentially, it's essentially propaganda in a way because if propaganda is to be taken as what we said earlier, which is, you know, the the systematic propagation of a given doctrine, yeah, you're like, I guess I, I'm struggling in my head to delineate the difference between the doctrine and also knowledge or like yes. belief. Yeah. It's almost yeah. the same thing to me. Like, believing in something is a doctrine right like a, i guess a doctrine a may be when someone attributes it to you beliefs or set of beliefs held and taught by a church political political party or other group so it's so it's, it's a real, set of beliefs held and taught by a political party or other group so it's like hmm okay because to me it's just like a because you you get beliefs through the educational system therefore the educational system is technically in a way a form of propaganda to a degree because your yeah. beliefs are formed and the, the beliefs these beliefs are chosen and selected by a political group the you know the democratically elected elite yeah. Yeah. choose the you know the agenda of education so to speak um yeah and I think if you hold quite a loose um, definition of propaganda such as that, then, yeah, education does kind of cross over with it. Um, it kind of has to, to a degree. Like, yeah. you know, but it's, it's, a broad, it's a broad definition that is basically just saying... Once again, it's just a very blurred line. It's yeah. a very, like, not, not clearly delineated line. And you can see, I guess, how propaganda can be i mean like we were saying a minute ago with the political agenda of the name changing is in the in the maths exams you can see how eventually over time this could this could change to 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 fit a certain political agenda for example well yes and i think we also have like we probably have quite a strong association to propaganda as being negative but as we'll find out next week when we do propaganda by edward bernays he was basically stating that it's a tool at the end of the day that can be used for good or bad. And he has a slightly different definition of it. But the fact is, is that it can be used as a tool of propaganda, kind of education. Yeah. And like we've just seen that there are political, like, you know, agendas that are pushed through and come in through the content. Um, but that's, yeah, it's whether it's used for good or bad, um, mm. which is the bottom line of it. Um should, yeah. we, should we move on to this bit about the because we're talking about selectivity of education but also there's yeah. the selectivity of the news so selectivity of news is the beginning of propaganda as walter Littman once put it without some form of censorship propaganda in the strict sense of the word is impossible in order to conduct a propaganda there must be some barrier between the public and the event access to the real event must be limited before anyone can create a pseudo environment that he thinks wise or desirable for while people who have direct access can misconceive what they see, no one else can decide how they shall misconceive it unless he can decide what they should look and at what. Um, yeah. Oh, wow. It sounds very ominous, doesn't it? I mean, it's when just like he restricting was, someone from their own reality. and that Yeah, because he wrote Public Opinion, I believe, and he was the, the inspiration behind mm. Edward Bernays, I, yeah. if I believe correct. And Edward Bernays has had a massive impact in terms of 
public relations industry, which, you know, inform a lot of political figures, strategies on how they present themselves to the public. Yeah. Uh, bearing in mind, that's the sort of underlying philosophy, which underpins all of this. You do have to wonder because yeah. it literally is saying, you know, if, if the event hasn't been seen, we can selectively represent the event in ways that, you know, fit an agenda. So for example, if you look at what happens with social media, where let's just say it's somebody on the right or somebody on the left, and they want to mischaracterize somebody, because we haven't seen the event, they take a snippet, a soundbite without any context, and then they present the frame, which is, can't believe this person is homophobic. Can't believe this person yeah, yeah. did this. And what they've done there is they've withheld, because obviously not, not many people have enough time or care to go in and see if this is an actual rep, true representation of what happened. They take the frame that's given to them and the selected content and take it as this person is a bad person. Yeah, And that's how I see how this is used and weaponized in a way uh, these days. It's it's interesting because I've just had a thought, like <clears throat> because today, right? So this this book was written, what, 40 years ago? Let's have a little look. I think it is that, yeah. I think it's like 1985 or 1981, something like that. Uh, uh, 19, well, I could be wrong. Nine, about 1992, 1992, apparently. 92, um, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's before phones, right? It's before Whereas phones. now... We took off as well. So in this quote, right, it says that there must be a barrier between public and the event. But that's very difficult when everyone's got their own news device on their, uh, in their hand, right? So yeah. they can take videos and everything like that. So how can you create propaganda if you can't have that barrier between the public and the event? And I know that there's still obviously like main news um, uh, establishments such as BBC and all of that lot that hold a lot more weight. And then everything kind of like falls in line with that. But actually, I wonder whether a new form of propaganda to basically break that barrier down is to create the event if okay. you get what I mean. So if you, cause you've heard about like, for instance, police going undercover as people in a, in a protest to make it go ugly so that then the, the protest becomes more like, I've a, heard of these, like where they right? put bricks out in, in streets. Yeah. I've heard so, this potential. Yeah. So I wonder whether a lot of proper, like in, in the most, you know, insidious sense is manufactured because they can't have that, there isn't a barrier between the public and the event anymore. If you get what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, I, I, well, let's put it this way. If it's a possibility, there's always a chance. Yeah. And, and it's, it's probably a lot easier to create an event to, to create incentives to, to, you know, push an agenda you want than it is to, um, you know, wait for the event to happen naturally. Yeah. Because you want everyone to have the same reality. That's the idea here. They want everyone to make the same decision or to get in line. That's the whole point of propaganda is basically how to influence the masses. Well, yeah, it's, it's to control you know? people's beliefs, right, essentially. It's yeah. to make sure everybody believes and acts in the same way because obviously it's a lot easier to to control and direct when yeah. everybody believes the same thing. Yeah. Um, and we're kind yeah, of so, seeing, yeah. it like, you know, it, it's weird that, like, for instance, TikTok in Ukraine and Russia – Right, like seeing certain things happening when the only times that you would ever have seen that is a news crew being there, you know. Yeah, and so yeah. there is this like new war, like I don't know, dynamic well, in like warfare, which is yeah. Well, there's well, the classic their phones and stuff like that. But there's also the classic disinformation stuff as well, where like yeah. part of warfare now is actually creating fake information and spreading it. So like there literally is. Oh, there's a book. In fact, we should probably read it while we're on propaganda. It's called. Let me just double check. I'm pretty sure it's called This Is Not Propaganda. Wait, this is not propaganda. Yeah, it is that book. And it I remember starting reading it and it talks a lot about how there literally is now farms, like uh disinformation farms in like Thailand, where the people are yeah. paid just to like comment Make, fake yeah. news essentially and create fake, you know, information. And obviously yeah. I don't know if you've seen recently as well with the um there's this like it went quite <laughs> mental on Twitter where um, a girl created like an AI version of a bloke um, and basically filmed herself and basically managed to superimpose AI on herself, managed to mm -hmm. get to 150 K followers on TikTok, and then revealed herself as, as the woman, like removed the AI filter because no, it changed really. her voice. It changed her body. And was like, like uh, it's so easy to like now take people down politically. Cause you could basically superimpose yourself doing something really bad 
Well, it's and like then, deep fakes, yeah. Yeah, no, it's literally, it is like, it is yeah. deep fakes, essentially. Um, it's so, oh man, like, like when that happens, because it yeah. will happen. It's, it's, no, it's, it's going to happen. But, it's, but it's, the it's thing is, it's like, so in the pixel world, it's so easy to recreate things which aren't true. So yeah. it's really hard to know. And once again, like, we have to get our source of information from somewhere. And if you can't trust the source of information because they're selectively giving you what they want you to think about an event, what can you trust? Like, it's, it's just, it's, it's oh, it's actually so bad. This is why I think this humanity is just going to crumble at some point. Because think about it, it's like the trust in any establishment is just getting fucked because well, of you, the fact that there is a farm to create, you know, fake content. You know, the problem is always going to be bad really actors, changes right? people's the beliefs. Problem. There's always going to be people who don't really oh, listen yeah. or don't abide by the same rules. They're willing to fight dirty because at the end of the day, you know, moral rules are something we use to try and keep people in check, but yeah. there's always going to be people who think they're either above them or just have different moral rules and they're not going to be afraid to, you know, it's the classic, like, I think even Putin was saying, like, you know, these like international warfare rules, like, fuck that. Like if you're at war, you, you're, you're at war. Like yeah. you're going to, if you want to win, you want to win. You don't play. Like, yeah. I mean, there is a level of like, you have to play by some rules, but, but not really. This is just like, I don't us. think you, I for don't example, think you if do. We, like, I, I find it weird win, that there's, yeah. Yeah, what, Sorry, there's like decorum in war. Like you think, of course, it's, it's weird. It don't, I don't think it exists. They pretend it exists, and when push comes to shove, they will break the rules they set because yeah. they have to to win, or they have to 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 get what they want. Right? So yeah, it's you wouldn't you wouldn't have gone to war otherwise. It's, it's lip, like the it's last lip fucking, service. Yeah, it's, it's lip it's, service. I've never understood the idea of war crimes unless it's something that is post-war. Because it's not like you can charge people for war crimes during a war. It doesn't make sense that they're in a war. It's like, you also have to win the war to then make them pay the war crimes. Because obviously, yeah. you're like, no, fuck you, I'm not paying you. Like, what, I what, think, or, like, what world can you make me pay if we all have nuclear weapons? Yeah. Like, oh, you're gonna you're gonna try and force me to pay you? Well, fine, blow me up, and I'll just blow you up. It's like there's I think no like, the power only, dynamic there. The only time, the only thing that I can think where where it plays a favor is. Um, making them look bad to other countries that aren't involved. Mm -hmm. So if you blew up a ship with loads of women and children on it, right. And you weren't, and you're, or you, you're a country and you saw them do that. Would you get in? This is it, isn't it? But you can create these fake events. Yeah, you of just course. talked about faking, creating these fake events. You could literally create the war crime and do the war crime yourself, yeah, and it'd be like Russia did it. Um, and no, I was whilst, yeah. that like propaganda book I was talking about, which was recommended from Bernays, I think, or whatever, yeah. where they talked about they dissected the UK propaganda from World War One, and they literally talked about how they just made up war crimes. They literally just yeah. made them up to like stiffen the people's resolve. Yeah. Um, yeah, course, mate. Like, like also, uh, yeah, because I remember when this whole like Ukraine thing was kicking off. I was thinking, okay, well, China's there and basically they they need to, they're on the fence, right? They're supposed to be closer in terms of with Putin, okay, with Putin. But, um, but they want Taiwan, okay? And so you kind of, like, either they could go against Putin and be seen as, like, the heroes for the West, although that wouldn't last very long, or they'd partner up with Russia and they go against... Um, Taiwan. and they go against america but think about like if you were trying to play the other play the other side then imagine like dressing up as um chinese people to then attack someone so that then there's another another war do you see my point as in like you're pretending to be another nation and then you're roping them in and that's yeah, yeah. what i think is like really dangerous because like you could do it you could create a there's a lot event. of deception and warfare a lot of strategy is deception so think about the um the trojan horse the classic example yeah. of deception like here's a gift <laughs> yeah you know yeah. makes you know your city's fallen um yeah. i guess this is yeah the reality is when people realize that they can be deceived it becomes an actual viable strategy to do things that you want yeah um and it, it's it's the um it's the whole uh prison dilemma isn't it? It's like, who's going to give first? Are you both going to play by the same rules or is someone going to deceive you first and they're going to take advantage? Yeah. You know, it's like, because like I mean, when it comes to other, war, yeah. it's like, there aren't any rules like you just said. So you well, know, the, do yeah. you play by this? There's, there's, by the rule there's, rules. Rules. there's yeah. like, there's, there's rules they claim exist, but don't yeah. because also you can never control the people on the foot. Like, you know, the foot soldiers as well, right? Like, you know, you yeah. might have rules that you set, but you know, it's well documented yeah. throughout history that raping and pillaging happens, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, and that's yeah. not something, you know, people don't decree it from the general level. Like, oh yeah, you know, my soldiers go, you know, go forth and 
molest <laughs> you know they don't yeah. say that it just happens because people on the, f- the floor decide they're going to just be barbaric yeah um there's a nature of humanity which you know uh, that releases itself in situations which are like that it's just yeah no, exactly so yeah on, on the um on the news front basically the things that are selected and prioritized are normally the things that are like vivid and can be dramatized because that's what gets like once again they're looking for viewers you know they're looking the for entertainment to like yeah get yeah. people to watch it you know what gets yeah. people to watch it like he makes a really good point here which is like you know you're way more likely to watch a dam you know cracking in half and spilling out water and you know causing a massive disaster than you are you know seeing a dam hold back gallons of water every day so like yeah. the thing which is more important the fact that it's day after day holding back water saving lives providing water which is obviously yeah. more important than the oh well, i guess it, you could argue it is important that it's cracked but like that doesn't get any television service because yeah. it's boring because yeah. it's worked. And I yeah. was saying this before the call about like the NHS, you just, you only ever see the like massively long queues, you know, the, how it's failing, but you never see the fact that it still saves thousands, potentially yeah. even hundreds of thousands of people a day. Yeah. And it still, it still helps. Like it's helping, it's working, yeah. but it's not working yeah. well, but all you focus on is the negative instead of the fact that when it works normally, nobody's like going oh my god it's amazing it's working normally it's just yeah. always there's you know there's always focus on the negative and i i kind of understand the like the need to do that for improvement but at the same time we just get this really distorted picture where everything's wrong and everything like everything's going wrong you know all and, the time. and it's it's uh it's like factfulness you know it's it's it we have this distorted idea of how bad the world is because the things that are normally presented to us are things that grab our attention which normally like survival risks or things that are like morally outrageous even on social media think about it, the things that get shared are the things that are morally outrageous because why would you share them otherwise you know mm-hmm. so then in normal in normal daily life we'd walk out and how often do we really come across something that's morally outrageous nothing, nothing you go normal, online yeah. and it's like 50 different things it's like you know um, yeah, yeah yeah so it does it distorts um reality or how we perceive reality yeah for sure i think as well it's quite interesting how i guess back in the day the selection mechanism a lot of it was um you know what news news uh what news panels or whatever news co- media companies, sorry, wanted to show people. Whereas yeah. now actually a lot of the selection is algorithmic. Yeah. If you think about it. So a lot of the propaganda that's selected and sh- shown is actually a reflection of our, you know, our interests in sort of, you know, the morally, uh, morally charged events. Yeah. You know? Yeah, no, absolutely. But then what, what happens is when people, when the algorithms know that and they, and they present the morally charged events to people, it creates incentives for people to create fake morally charged events exactly. to keep people hooked. Like there, there's like literally an incentive for Facebook and Twitter to, to pay farm bots with disinformation because at least then people will stay on the platform to argue. Yeah. Yeah, you know, is, isn't, isn't that fucked that we're, I'm not sure we, they're probably not doing that, but you know, no, no, I know. Incentive for them to do it. But that's my point, as in, like, you know, it's a, like a platform it. for us to watch really morally outrageous stuff rather than finding a way to keep us on a platform for, like, a good reason, mm. right? It's just, yeah, uh, it's weird. Yeah. It's like a cesspool, isn't well, it? Well, it's like a, yeah, it's a bit dystopian, dystopian yeah. to be honest, it's kind of, yeah. yeah. Um, all right, so I let's think, finish off with this next Can we just delete that? that? No, no, I, I just, I just oh. changed it. Um, okay, you've so got now, the misalignment. Yeah, yeah. So this is basically saying that, what does it say? In many ways, it is dangerous to apply the labels education and propaganda to a communication merely on the basis of whether it agrees or disagrees with one's values. The point is that the bias of a communication is often in the eye of the beholder. What is labeled as propaganda and what is labeled as education depend on one's own propaganda purposes. And I think that's basically like we were talking about this before the call, but it's kind of like a confirmation bias. If we make decisions and then it turns out that there's information to ridicule that decision, then we'll basically label it with propaganda. We'll be like, oh, no, they're trying to persuade me that it's trying to corrupt me. You know, know, my decision was right because we double down on what we did. I do quite like this point here. Like the Protagoras book was considered heretical in its day. And today a similar volume mm. is called a textbook. You know, it's yeah. the same thing. Like, you know, time changes and cultural changes, like label things as, you know, negative and or as good or as good, right? Like in my head, 
you know, back in the Nazi Germany, I'm sure Mein Kampf was almost seen as like a Bible, you know, yeah. you kind of get what I mean, or maybe not, but it was probably I seen as, you know, <laughs> yeah, the point being it's, it changes depending upon the situation, what people yeah. believe to be propaganda and education. And it's usually like, like, like here it's based upon values. So, yeah. you know, what's education vs what's propaganda is based upon what people perceive as valuable. Therefore, if you know, your value is, you know, I guess freedom, liberty, and then you see people trying to be authoritarianism, you label it as propaganda just because it really doesn't sit well with your values. No. Um, it's yeah, it's, it's quite interesting because it, it is very uh, clear to see in this day and age where like, you know, you, you almost see it on Twitter and stuff all the time where people are like, if they don't agree with what's being said, they're like, well, you, that's just propaganda. Yeah. That's and just, it, yeah. It's really and, interesting. I've been reading this, this, the, on, in the seven habits of highly effective people. Yeah. He, um, defines the difference between habit, um, principles and values and that values change depending on the type of person that you are, whereas principles stay the same. And that's the thing. It's like, you know, our values are all different. We all hold different things valuable, literally. Um, and so we basically choose what is propaganda based on what we value. You know? mm-hmm. um, yeah. Well, we, yeah. But but I guess as well, the term here has become, which we'll explore in Edward Bernays' book, but the term has become, has come to mean like nefarious mm. uh, persuasion. Like propaganda, yeah. the term when you use it these days is like persuasion in a way that's wrong. I guess you could yeah. say it's like it's morally charged and it's it's kind of like it's insidious. It's it's nefarious. It's not it's not like a nice uh, way of trying to change people's beliefs. Or at least yeah. that's how I perceive propaganda. But maybe that's yeah. because of just the way my I've been culturally indoctrinated around the word. Um, I think we all kind of have, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I think, yeah, right. Rash, I think that is everything we've covered with that. I mean, to be honest, we could we can flesh out some more of these like education, these propaganda ideas when we do the Edward Bernays book because that's yeah, yeah. you know what that's is it like? Design, yeah. It's like eighty pages long, so we're gonna have to yeah. uh, flesh it out a little bit. Um, but cool. So now we <laughs> we've got if anybody's an aspiring cult leader, we've got here we the, go. I believe seven steps to becoming a cult or to set becoming a cult leader. Sorry. Yeah. Um, this I actually really enjoy this part of the book. I just thought it was quite interesting because it it kind of like obviously the rest of the book was explaining some of the propaganda techniques yeah. uh, that can be used, etc. Right, and then this kind of sort of gives you a real life example of how they can create such a powerful force to create such such a thing as a cult where people yeah. literally go on and is it the Johannesburg cult, the one where they all took their lives? It's something like that. It was like Nicaragua, wasn't it? Or something, something like, like this. That? Yeah. yeah. But the 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 um the inspiration for this sort of cult, how to create a cult came from the fact that there was a cult where the leader managed to get everybody to commit suicide. And there was like 150 people, right? So yeah. the point being here, propaganda could be so powerful to create such a, like a bond between people that they eventually convince somebody to be able to tell everybody else to kill themselves. And they all, not all, but most comply. Yeah. Um, so if <laughs> I'm hoping that's not what people's goals are with this, yeah. but here we go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But um, here we go. Love with it. that being said, so number one, create your own social reality. So the first step in creating a cult is to construct your own social reality by eliminating all sources of information other than that provided by the cult. Cult headquarters should be isolated from the rest of the world. A farm in Oregon, a secluded house of the os- outskirts sorry, of town, a jungle in Guay- Guyana. Is that how you pronounce it? I, Guyana, so. I think. Yeah. Members mail should be censored. Families should be prevented from visiting members. Strict boundaries between believers and the unredeemed must be maintained. Such censorship can be physical. That is forcibly excluding outsiders and physically restraining wayward members. However, it's much more practical to teach members self-censorship by labeling everything uh, that is not of the cult as of the devil, which yeah. is quite, quite an interesting point. It um, is, isn't it? The second step in constructing a social reality is to provide a cult's eye view of the world. This picture of the world is then used by members to interpret all events and happenings. For example, Jim Jones taught that there was a constant threat of nuclear war and that the world is full of racism. To be prepared to live in this evil world, one must be ready to die. Um, because this is the guy, isn't it, Jim? Jim yeah, Jones, I think that was the guy. Yeah. 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 Um, so one useful technique for constructing a social reality is to create your own language and jargon. For example, 
Divine Light Mission members call their services Satsang and Darshan. Um, and then what's this? The, the, yeah, the rest of it, basically creating your own language to create sort of a shared, you know, meaning that only you guys or the, the cult themselves would understand. Um, and when it comes to teaching your social reality, there is one additional point to keep in mind. Repeat your message over and over again. Uh, repetition makes the heart grow fonder and, uh, and fonder, I guess. I don't know if that meant to say fiction. If heard frequently enough, it can come to sound like a fact. Um, no, no, yeah. so let's, should we dissect this a little bit? So Yeah, let's do it. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because when I like read this or when I hear it, it just sounds so much like a kind of an abuse victim, isn't it? It's like what, uh, yeah. what no, do no, it is. do? It's basically like it's a isolating cult, you, isn't it? It's yeah, like a, exactly. Yeah. It's isolating you from any other reality so that they're dependent on you and that you create the reality. It's basically gaslighting at the end of the day, but, um, and creating that social fake reality. And yeah. it is interesting that if you can, if you can make it intrinsic to them so that they start to actually see the world in this way and actually attribute all of their like beliefs in this way, then it's self reinforcing. And mm. that's what I think his point was here about like, you know, um, uh, a much more practical way is to teach members self censorship by labeling everything that is not of the cult yeah. as of the devil. Right? Yes, and yeah. it's and so it, they're it's doing a classic, it themselves. It's the good, the evil story. It's, yeah. it's the thing that you know gets people out of bed. The sort it's of like the, the moral judgment that we all have, like tuned into us. That like almost everything we see. I I can't remember. Where I read it. It might be in the art of storytelling. Yeah. Um. But he was talking about like there is this just moral. There's this moral dimension to the way we perceive the world that you just yeah. can't remove from human beings. The good and evil yeah. story is as old as day. It's the yeah. only story that we ever tell ourselves about anything. When we watch people act, it's good or like it's good or bad, right? Like that is yeah. literally the lens we perceive yeah. most things. Um, and we ch- and obviously the, yeah. we choose like, what is like good or evil. Yeah, yeah well, it, this, it, it, we? it can be it can be influenced, right? Depending yeah. upon how, the story we tell ourselves below it. Um, but yeah, this this the interesting part here. I, I think is just the fact that it is it's easier to do this stuff than people think in my head. There are many social realities in my head based upon other areas of your life. You could call, you can have many social realities within friends. You can have many social realities within like specific knowledge sets. So, I mean, he's talking here about specific language that only people in on it get, but you could even argue stuff like economics, stuff like finance. They have their own language, which says the same thing. Um, which, sorry, could be said more easily without the jargon. But by saying the jargon, you almost signal to other economics people, you're like, I'm an economist, you know? Yeah. It's the yeah. same thing. It's, I mean, obviously you can't reduce all like really complex subject matters to like simple language because when things get more complex, you have to have different words for different things. Yeah. But the point remains the same that they're, you know, creating jargon sort of signals to each other that you're part of this group in their no. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I, I think... The way that I see it is that the first step in this idea of creating a social reality, that social reality is basically a schema and you want to basically embed it into people so that once you kind of let them go, right, once it's been created, they assimilate everything into that schema. So everything is seen with that lens, right? Everything is resorting and being distorted Mm -hmm. through into that schema. And that's what I think is so interesting. If you start seeing everything as good and bad or, you know, good and evil. Um, yeah. But I think, I think what is more important with this social reality is it. So we kind of almost default see things as good and bad to a degree. I, I, I believe that's kind of built into us to see yeah, things yeah. as like good or bad. But what, what's interesting here is they help you define what's good and bad. And they create, like you said, like a schema around what is good, what is bad. Yeah. And they reinforce it as a group. Um, so that, that becomes your reality of what is good, what is bad. And therefore, like, I guess the longer this goes on once again with the repetition, you repeat it again and again, it's impossible to, like, not believe the things yeah. um, that being repeated again and again, because, you know, that's all you know. Yeah. And everybody else is in the same boat with you. No, exactly. Um, exactly. On, on, on that jargon, I, I remember a book now I got here, which I made me laugh. So, like, back in the day, the accounting professors, an accounting professor said this, every business case is the same solution. Increase sales, cut costs, and make the bastards work hard, work harder. And you just skip ahead into the modern day. So you say, in order to maximize shareholder value, there are three main strategies. 
revenue growth, operating margin, and capital efficiency. And that's literally <laughs> the same thing. So yeah. obviously revenue growth is make more money, operating margin is cut costs, and capital efficiency is make the bastards work harder. That's funny. And it kind of just made me laugh, like this idea of, you know, trying to make things sound really like intelligent and stuff yeah, yeah. inside a, you know, uh, a knowledge set. That's yeah. funny. Um, so step two, do you want to go for it? Uh, yep. Yeah. So the grand balloon technique, um, the grand balloon technique requires the creation of an in group of followers and an out group of the unredeemed. The technique allows you to control members by constantly reminding them if you want to be chosen, then you must act like a chosen one. If you are not chosen, then you are wicked and unredeemed. Um, to be saved, you must act like you are supposed to act. Um, the essential ingredient in establishing an in-group of believers is the creation of social identity, an image of who we are. Joining a cult represents a break from the other world and the acceptance of this new identity. The reverse side of the Grand Floon tactic is the creation of an out-group to hate. The children of God teach member teach members to hate their parents. One <laughs> Mo letter states that parents are evil. They are not your true family. We are your family now. So the creation of an evil outgroup serves the dual um, purpose of making members feel good about belonging to the group. I'm glad I'm not like them and increasing their fears about leaving the group. I don't want to be like them. So if grand balloon techniques are correctly applied, then you should be successful in creating fear of the outside world and the belief that the cult is the only solution to a happy life. Life is thus impossible outside the cult, the only solution to life's problems. Yeah. I mean, we talked about the grand Falloon, grand Falloon technique in our in our last uh, podcast with the Blue Shirt Boys. Yeah. Um, <laughs> on a slightly more nefarious use of the grand Falloon, you uh, you obviously create like a shared social identity around. Yeah. Uh, I guess being the chosen one. I guess in a weird way, it's like being the ultimate hero, like the ultimate yeah. good guy. Um, and then you've got obviously here the opposite side of it, which is you know, devilizing or demonizing. Sorry the yep. out group so basically anybody who tells you otherwise and what's in my head particularly nefarious is you can kind of label anybody who rejects your you know hero's chosen story or like who rejects mm -hmm. your ideology is then therefore now categorized as you know a demon and they're trying to hold you back from this like sacred truth um which is particularly nefarious because it basically means anybody who's trying to help you get out of the, the situation you're in yeah. is then becoming an enemy as defined yeah. by the group. And there's obviously a lot of group pressure there to all be like, you got it. You can't listen to the enemy. Like these are the bad guys. This is who we're fighting. Yeah. This is what we're up against. Um, yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. Isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting because as soon as that kind of split dynamic is made, then you're either in it or you're out. And mm -hmm. that's like, I thought the key point here was that, you know, it's creating fear out there. So once again, like you're in a state of fear if you go out there. So the solution mm. is to remain the in-group, right? I would um, also guess they'd probably heavy police the idea of like, if you go outside of your cult and speak to somebody who's like an enemy, I can imagine they police it very um, strictly in a cult. Like, you know, the moment yeah. you literally speak to anybody who's outside of, you know, the cult, you're probably like a, you know, her heretic or like you're going to be kicked out almost immediately. So they almost like I think that's police. I think that's yeah. literally one of the, one of the later steps. Um, yeah which I think is should have kind of be applied quite early because you want oh, to is, make no, that sure that they steps, don't. Yeah. 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 Um, and I think what's also interesting with the grand Falloon technique is that once you're in the in group, there is like a certain behavior that you must abide by to be one of the people in that, in that group. It's like the blue shirt boys do this, right? People yeah, yeah. in this cult do this. So you're mm. already starting to manufacture their behavior and make them um, resort to it. Yeah, we are, the, we are the chosen ones who live by this sort of style yeah. of life. This is how we do things here because we are these people. We yeah. are the redeemed. We are going to, you know. Like people in this hate their parents, right? As in, yeah, like, I actually can't believe that. The, the children of God ridiculous. hate their parents. Like, my God. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Jesus. My God, ridiculous. Um, um, okay, cool. so on to the next Let's one. Move on to step three, which kind of links to, to the above, I think. Uh, step three is create commitment through dissonance reduction. So cults can ensure members' obedience by establishing a spiral of escalating commitment. The cult member at first agrees to simple requests that becoming uh, that become sorry increasingly more demanding. Jim Jones used such a technique, extracting great trust from his followers one step at a time. 
I can't remember exactly what the technique was, but I guess it's the level of like just getting them to share, like share something with you. Maybe mm, once, yeah. like tell me, tell me something or give me something. And then over time, the elucidate more further, further commitments. Yeah. We spoke about this in influence, didn't we? Um, and then after making an initial commitment, one does not feel comfortable reneging on the deal to justify the sensibility of the initial commitment. The member is often willing to do more and then still more to make increasingly demand uh, to meet increasingly demanding commitments. In this way, the resolution of dissonance and maintenance of one's self-image as honoring commitments from a powerful uh, from a po- from a powerful uh, sorry form a powerful rationalization trap. Um, so yeah, this is literally what you just wrote there: commitment and consistency, um, as spoke about in influence. It's yeah. a very powerful force when you've started taking actions in a certain direction. It's very hard to go back, which is almost why the first step is always the hardest. Because once you've started, you're kind of on the on the path to forming this new sort of character, I guess. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, it is. Uh, is it this one or is it another one? Okay, yeah, it's it's later on, but it's such a good point. But yeah, no, exactly. Once you start committing to something, then you have to try and convince yourself. Either it takes a lot of effort to go back against it and renege it and basically suggest, oh, my actions were wrong. But a lot of the time we don't like to do that anyway. And so we double down on the, on our actual actions, our behavior. Um, so in this regard, you know, it's like you start working for the cult and it's like, okay, well now I can justify it. Yeah. You know? um, now I've, you know, spent five hours with these guys, yeah. spent like an hour every Saturday. Now I'm yeah. willing to spend more time, that type of thing, yeah, I guess. Exactly. Putting it. And I think that Jim Jones guy they used to work like 16 hour days or something. So you're yeah. working a lot, right? No, and that, it's like, yeah. did I just work 16 hours for a fucked up guy? No, I worked 16 hours he's, for he's the chosen kin one. of God. Yeah, like, yeah. You know? um, yeah, exactly. So, and I think it's like, it's really incremental as well, which yes. makes it even harder to, you know, you're not going from zero to a hundred straight away. You're doing tiny little things, but just consistently. So yeah. you're not even aware that you're, increasing that workload or that commitment yeah um yeah do you want to, do you want to go for the next one mate? Yeah, let's do the next one. <clears throat> so the next one is establish the leader's credibility and attractiveness um so most cults have leader myths stories and legends passed from member to member concerning the life and times of the cult leader Unification Church biographers compare Moon's birth in Pyongbuk, North Korea, with Jesus' <laughs> birth in Bethlehem. Both were at night, both were in small unknown villages, and both marked the dawn of cos- uh, cosmic transition. What is the purpose of such myths? Well, it is hard to disobey a person <laughs> believed to be the son of God, or at least blessed by a divine purpose. Anybody in their own right, um, in their right mind, should seek to identify and be a like, uh, be like a holy person. So, yeah, yeah so this is just kind of yeah. funny. It's just like deifying, you know, yeah. um, the the cult leader, deifying yourself, creating <clears> or, <throat> like almost origin backstories. You know, like I fell into a vat of acid and now I've come out with superpowers. But it's yeah. kind of like, but they all they all kind of do this. Not even cult leaders, even um, people who try and sell you on like a specific lifestyle or whatever. They they kind of have, give you this like backstory of like they were like you know trudging along and then they suddenly discovered the truth. You know, they suddenly yeah. had that moment of realization where everything like the the cosmos just all aligned and they became at one with truth yeah um but it, it, it is interesting isn't it like you can create some seriously weird backstories as well like from this i just i'm thinking of messed up superhero backstories yeah. now but um no i point, uh, yeah yeah what it's interesting because the past probably like you know if we go back you know a thousand years ago or whatever it would probably be hard to refute and so there would probably be people where there are stories about them and it's just accepted as gospel you know, as in like, and rather than, whereas yeah. today we have certain like people who we um, praise like experts. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and yeah. so, so it's easier. It's, so there's more to like refute them. Whereas like, you know, back then there wouldn't have been. So it's just like, Oh, he was born from the goddess. Perf- Basically, yeah. Anybody who's good like magic, exactly you know, like magic tricks, that, right? You know, magic yeah. tricks. If you were good at magic tricks, you could have probably been back in the day, you know, an absolute yeah. God, just like, you know, like even <laughs> the water true. to wine thing. Can you imagine if Jesus was just a magician? Like he was just a really good magician, and he was like, "I'm going to turn those water to wine." He did like some sort of like magic trick, and he's like, yeah. "Wow!" And everybody's like, "No way!" Like, sick. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. 
it reminds me of um the life of brian you know when he like yeah he doesn't want to be jesus and everything he does everybody's just like messiah <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's so good. i mean obviously this is um yeah. slightly different because we're talking about you know if you want to uh set up your own cult you you kind of need to like be more intentional in constructing these myths yeah um you almost need a you actually almost need a backstory like a a mystic backstory yeah um yeah it's interesting should we um move on to the next ones yes yeah so number five send members out to proselytize the unredeemed uh i would just say convert the unredeemed right I mean, yeah, uh, I really struggle with that word. <laughs> right, so, uh, proselytize. I think is something. that yeah, pros- pros- proselytize. Yeah, convert the unredeemed. I would say yeah. so. Witnessing, uh, wait, wait, let's, uh, bring in. so what is witnessing to the unconverted has the obvious advantage of bringing in new ver- uh, new members. Perhaps just as important is oh, proselytizing. Okay, I get it now. It's not converting. Yeah. It's preaching yeah isn't it it's preaching okay. yeah it is yeah. so number five <laughs> send members <laughs> send members out to preach to the unredeemed uh yeah. witnessing to the unconverted has the obvious advantage of bringing in new members why does it witnessing and now i'm getting pranged out because the witnessing shouldn't be that word right if you read that that doesn't i don't know I, I i don't know um actually i'm gonna put i'm gonna just let me just we'll do it one more time <laughs> five <laughs> take three uh <laughs> Number five, send members out to preach to the unredeemed. Preaching to the unconverted is the obvious advantage of bringing in new members, but perhaps just as important is preaching can ensure that members are constantly engaging or engaged in self-sell or self-generated persuasion. The act of preaching requires the member to state anew to many different people the positive advantages of being in a cult. In arguing to convince others, members convince themselves. Evangelical activity also strengthens resolve. Each witness is likely to elicit many negative responses or an attack on the cult. In defending their beliefs, cult members learn to refute a wide range of attacks, thus inoculating themselves against counter-arguments and thereby maintaining their belief in the cult. Um, yeah, I mean... This is I love similar, this step, actually. Yeah, it's just it's it's so the, clever. Um, it's so clever, I think. It is similar you, to the commitment and consistency stuff, right? It's, but it's, it's like the it next is. level. But also like selling yourself. So you have to put forward the good points to everyone else. And then if they ever re- reject or like argue against, you have to come up with ways to over overcome those arguments. Yeah, so yeah. you're selling yourself the whole time. And then there's just a benefit that you might sell it to someone else. I think another interesting point is a lot of this preaching, I guess, would be to family and friends. And therefore, um, you lose the ability to go back because you've got a safe fa- safe face with these people as well. If you're co- yeah. if you're uh, constantly preaching to people you know about as well about a specific thing, it is very hard for you then in the future to renege on these things you're preaching because you come yeah. across as somebody who's like obviously just you've made a public deluded. stance. Haven't you? Yes, yeah, yeah. Especially if it's something as technically, oh, well, I was going to say technically, yeah, I was going to say technically disillusioned or delusional. But it, I guess these people don't see themselves as delusional. But something like yeah. to come back from this is pretty, pretty hard hitting. Like it's gonna, it's gonna yeah. take a lot to come back from. Basically, you know, uh, reneging on all your family, all your commitments. You know, yeah. committing to a group of people who think they're divine saviors, not necessarily divine saviors, but in on the truth that nobody else knows. And then to come back from that must be pretty, pretty hard. Um, <laughs> so clever. But also, I wonder if, like, a more modern-day version of this is basically, like, pyramid schemes, right? As in, like, okay. you you have to commit to trying to sell it to others, and in the process, you're selling it to yourself. Yeah, um, no, I, I, I do. Yeah. I think a lot of the crypto stuff was similar to that when, you know, if you constantly preach about something day in, day out, and about the future of, you know, technology, yeah, you have to believe it in some way because if you didn't, first of all, you'd be a massive hypocrite, and second yeah. of all, I think, you know, I guess just like you said, by doing the action, you just, you're building up this reputation with yourself where you actively believe in it. I just, I just don't yeah. think there's any other way around it. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes. It's such a funny step, but like, it makes so much sense. Oh gosh. Do you want to hit us up with number six? Yeah, let's do it. So distract members from thinking undesirable thoughts. 
So most cult doctrines are hard to take seriously, much less accept. The cult member, especially a new recruiter, is likely to question and counter-argue such basic points as the value of giving all one all one owns, especially a new sports car to the cult and the merits of working 16 hour shifts and turning over all proceeds to the cult leadership. So yeah, that's what I was talking about earlier on with the yeah, there um, was. gym guy. The old advertising saw, if you don't have anything to say, sing it. So that's one of the other, um, I think, principles that we mentioned, I think it was in the first um, part, actually. So um, probably never applied more than here. So how then does a cult leader distract a member from carefully scrutinizing and questioning the cult's doctrine? Well, there are other ways to disrupt counter-arguing in a cult. Chanting and singing prevent thinking about anything else but the chant and the song. (laughs) That's funny. Meditations such as those performed by the Divine Light Mission, in which the Premi spends hours trying to visualize light, hear music, taste nectar, and speak the primordial vibrations of existence, <laughs> prevent the meditator from focusing on other more uh, worldly concerns. Jesus the primordial, Christ. The primordial vibration of existence gets me. Oh I, my I God, like that. Yeah. Um, non-stop activities such as uh, proselytizing or preaching, working and cooking and cleaning for other members further limit the opportunity for careful thought and personal reflection. <laughs> Just, it's like, surely if someone was telling you to do this stuff all the fucking time, you'd just be like, why am I doing this all the time? Yeah, that's why am that's I the point, like, isn't it? It's, I know, it's this whole yeah. classic, like you, 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 well, first of all, the whole point is you're not meant to be thinking these things. They're meant to be yeah. keeping you busy to not think these things. But then even if you do, you're so far down the rabbit hole. It's like, it's one of these things where if you if you really reconsider something about maybe like your personal set, like self-image you have and like, what if I'm not this person I think I am? I'm like really different. You start feeling really uncomfortable. And then what do you do? You stop thinking about it because it's uncomfortable yeah. to think about it. So I think that's yeah, what yeah. that is, is a level of like the... They're probably in some sense aware of it at some level, but because it's so painful to think about that's that the possibility point, yeah. that they're wrong, they automatically just just go back to the now's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just keep going. Yeah, yeah. Just keep going with this. Um, yeah, it's yeah. Co- it's 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 like the whole idea is to make reality as unpleasant as possible so that they go back to social reality. This social yeah. reality that's been created. Yeah, yeah. interesting. It's. It, it, all of this, like you said, is actually really, really smart when you break it down and think about the actual. So whether or not these people are doing it, because I think he did say something at the end about Jim Jones that he, yeah, yeah, it's not that they're very. Um, these people they tend not to be sorry like so articulate with these things. Like they don't yeah. know these things like as step by steps like this. They kind mm-hmm. of just grasp it, don't they? they? Grasp the purpose of doing these things and how it yeah. affects people. Like if you were to get Jim Jones to write like a biography, obviously I think pretty sure he killed himself, right? But like he wouldn't be able to like articulate it in the way this is being articulated. Yeah. yeah. They just they just get yeah. a very good grasp of how to convince people yeah. and how to keep how well, how to brainwash people, I guess you could say. Yeah. Um okay. And then number seven to finish off. Last last point. Also, I, did you like I highlighted at the bottom surfing yeah. with <laughs> vibrations of existence? I, I, I love that. You have to bring that out. Like when somebody Gosh. is like, "How's it going, dude?" I'm like, "Yeah, yeah. no, it's yeah, I'm good surfing bro. the primordial of vibrations of existence, bro. How's it going?" Funny. Okay, right. Well, so, number seven and the very last step of creating your cult, you've got fixate members' vision on a phantom. I cannot actually remember what this. So a phantom can establish a powerful motivator of human behavior by providing a sense of purpose and mission. The successful cult leader is always dangling a notion of the promised land and a vision of a better world before the faithful. Unification church members follow and attend to the teachings of the Lord of the Second Advent so that they can be resurrected to the perfection state during the third and final stage. So number seven, fixed members' vision on a phantom. I would change the word phantom to like, uh, utopia or fixate member fixate members vision on a promised land yeah um yeah and it makes sense that you're basically trying to create a meaning or purpose right like mm. a reason why you have this cult or why you belong to the cult yeah and so if you create this like phantom or this fear or you create this like reason for doing something then you know it, it gives more purpose to it um, yeah it makes it deeper and more meaningful i guess to all the cult yeah, members yeah. Um. Yeah, 
Yeah, so, that, so that's it. Let's just let's quickly recap then. So if you yep. if you are serious about this cult business, um, then you one you got to start with the creating your own social reality, yeah, through eliminating uh, outside influences on your cult, um, providing a cult eye view, creating your own language, mm-hmm. and then repeating your message over and over again. Then number two, we've got this creating a grand falloon. So creating an in group and out group image, which you can make your followers aspire to live up to, and also then also uh an enemy to denigrate yep. um this creates fear of the outside world and a belief that the cult is the only solution to a happy life number three we've got the creating commitment through distance reduction so get people to create uh to make sorry commitments to your cult through small actions whether it's donations whether it's time um this sort of starts the commitment and consistency influence technique we we talked about an in influence uh book summary then you've got four, establish the leader's credibility and attractiveness. So the use of myths and backstories to create the deification of the leader or the to, to augment the attractiveness of the leader and why he should be listened to or he she should be listened to. Five is send members out to preach to the unredeemed. Get people to basically preach to others about the, you know, the the truth that they have discovered. Because not only does this, you know, strengthen their resolve because they can't go back on what they're saying to their families and friends, but they also self-sell themselves and self-convince through uh, counter-arguing and people argue against them. Then we've got six, distracting members from unthinking, uh, from thinking undesirable thoughts, so basically keeping people busy with activities, whether it's you know working hard on the cause or singing or chanting or probably in most other cults orgies. Um, <laughs> and then you've got seven, fixate members, um, Jesus, fixate members' vision on a promised land. So give them an ideal end goal of the cult. So like the the purpose of what they're doing. And there you go. There we go. How to create got, a cult. Got anything Bloody else to add? Hell. Is there any more sort of like sprinkles we can put on top of that on the top of that cake? We should create the, the blue shirt cult. No. <laughs> the blue shirt cult. One the, step the, the, more. But the, the strict rule is you can't actually wear blue shirts. That's the point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just oh mess with everybody. Um, it is it is a good way to put all of these things together actually all these different no, I, I thought it was um, it was a really it, good end to the book wasn't it like, yeah in, in the sense that it kind of made the propaganda techniques that were explored in the book actually applicable to like a real life yeah. example and and an extreme real life example of that um i'm wondering off the top of our head if we can actually add any value to this in terms of like is there any other things that he could have missed here that you know, from other the other influence books that we've read. So you've got like social proof. I guess he hasn't talked about social proof here, but part of but this I, whole yeah. part of it is social proof. Like social reality is a social proof in the sense that anybody who then in the cult follows the reality is proving to each other that that is the reality. If yeah. That makes sense. And also social pressure to conform to the same behavior within the grand falloon, right? So like, yeah. you know, you would be ostracized if you didn't behave like everyone else um and that's okay. the whole you know because they're creating like a category and putting you in it and being like you have to behave like this so that in a way is social proof because you're like copying everyone else um what else you is there li- liking so by creating a you know mystic mystique around the leader you're obviously going to yeah. like them but also doing doing chores and stuff for the leader you you have to kind of like them you kind of like i don't know if you ever heard that benjamin franklin quote quote sorry which is like you know to get somebody to like you, make them do you a favor because they have yeah. to rationalize doing you a favor. So they, they have like, to oh, I must like this person. Um, what else was there? Got liking, rep- familiarity. That's once again linked to repetition, yeah. repetition. being in, a, in a, an environment where everybody's repeating the same thing. Yeah. Um, uh, what else? Urgency. I guess you can bring urgency into it. Like the, the whole point of the Jim Jones where they all killed themselves at the end was this urgency to to end their lives based upon the fact that if they didn't, they wouldn't let go to the promised land or whatever. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. But it's less, um, less prevalent. I think. Um, there was the reciprocity thing. Is there, I guess doing each other within the group favors. Yeah. It was a better sense of camp camaraderie to a degree. Yeah. That you don't want to betray your, you know, your friends that you've done loads of favors for. And... But yeah, yeah, I mean, I can't really, I think that's, 
these are all and things that like sub authority authority, authority yeah. is basically like you know the cult leader giving him all these like deifying him um, yeah yeah well yeah i guess the main appeal is technically free authority isn't it like he is a divine being and he he or like he channels the divine being and yeah and also on top of that the last one is scarcity which i think you could probably argue that you're lucky to be in this cult. Yeah. You're so no, few, you know, scarcity like, of information, right? Yeah, the, exactly. Like, not everybody knows this truth. It's, yeah. it's the appeal of the red pill these days. Like, uh, do you want to, do you want to be red pill? Do you want to know what's actually going on? Everybody's yeah. like, yeah, I want to know what's actually going on. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, why wouldn't you? Um, but yeah. yeah. Cool. Cool. Well, so, so that was the third part of age of propaganda. Yeah. Hell. Hell. That was, that was a really, really long one. I don't, do we want to try and do, some sort of extra things here where we recap or do we, do we want to, I think we could quickly go over the, the points just that we covered today. So, um, yeah. So guilt and persuasion, basically, um, when people like elicit this guilt state so that you don't really listen to the clarity of the argument and you just see it as a solution to get rid of this guilt. Um, mm-hmm. then you have how to diagnose persuasive communication. So the questions that you should ask are what is this person incentivized for? So like, what does the source of the information have to gain? Why are their choices being presented to me in this manner? Are there other options and other ways of presenting those options? And what would happen if I chose something other than the recommended option? Uh, what are the arguments for the other side? Then you had propaganda um, and education, basically covering the idea that there are similarities between propaganda and education, how education can be used as a propaganda tool because it's about selectivity of information. At the end of the day, we get, we get taught certain things and we don't get taught others. Um, and then on selection of in propaganda, we are talking about news and how certain stories are shown to us on the news. Normally things that are more entertaining, um, more visual, more uh, things that can be dramatic and how they can distort our perception of reality um, and the world. And then I think lastly, it was about propaganda and value misalignment. So how we basically... Um, you know, we'll call something propaganda when it doesn't conform to our values or whether we make decisions and then we find out information that goes against them and we label it with propaganda to rationalize our decisions. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that does well summarized. Beautiful. It's almost like you do a book summary website. It's, it is, it is, isn't it? Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe I should start it. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. I think well, um, that's it. Yeah. So that, next week we're next? going to be doing propaganda by Edward Bernays, I think. Yes. 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 We will. And then Perfect. we're on to and then we're habits. On to productivity. Habits. 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 Beautiful. That's a wrap. All right. Okay. Well, that's a wrap. there you have it guys the last part of age of propaganda what a book now we get it it's a lot of information to take in but we figured we wouldn't be doing the book justice if we had only summarized it in one sitting now we hope you were able to take a few things away from these episodes and remember if you want to implement any of the lessons from this book or you want the information in a more bite-sized format well head on over to our website at wisewords.blog where you can find the book summary waiting for you Now, if you enjoyed these episodes, make sure to give us a like and let us know what you thought in the comment section below. We always love to hear from you. Now, in addition to that, why not subscribe to our channel so that you can be made aware when we next bring out another episode. And next week, we'll be tying up the propaganda and communication trend with Edward Bernays' propaganda before changing direction and focusing on habits. So make sure to stay tuned for that. But until next time, guys, have a good one.